we head to 1918, so early Akutagawa stories, where his writing was, I don't know, would you say more lucid, clear? Uh, is that a thing with Akutagawa? <laughs> That's fair. But perhaps what I should say is a reimagining of a classic tale in a way where he's just a master of his craft and tells it in an even more clear or different light. I feel like this is a story that you almost have to read both, and I'm sure that you'll uh, get into this, of the comparison of how understanding two stories enlightens in your enjoyment of both. Let's get into this story because we have ultimately a very Shakespearean presentation. It even starts out with like this soliloquy, the blood on the hands almost has these... It evokes Macbeth, Lady Macbeth, if you remember that. But it's it's ripe for the theater, where we open with this hook of this guy's like, well, I'm going to have to kill someone tonight underneath the moonlight. And immediately you're wondering, well, who, who are you going to kill? You, you have all this dramatic tension from like a reader's perspective. It's very dark compared to his other stories. And also, when you think about the who, for me, the first thing popped into my mind of why? Why are you going to kill this person? I, mm -hmm. I don't even care who it is. You're killing somebody regardless of the who is the why is the clutch for me. Mm -hmm. Well, and the questions don't stop. He talks about this Kesa and how he loves her, right? I guess in Japanese, the original Japanese, it uses AI, like AI, for love. But the problem is is that he knows that that's not the correct word. He knows it's an overstatement and that he's misusing the word and that there is an element of infatuation and an amount of just purely physical draw that isn't necessarily backed by the emotions for her. And that's complicated further by the fact that, I don't know how close he was, but, you know, she gets whisked away by Wataru, who, again, he doesn't hate, right? That This is the guy that we're going to kill. We don't even hate him and we're going to kill him for a girl that we don't even love and we actually kind of respect Wataru because he's a samurai that was learning to, to write love poems to woo this chick. I mean, what is going on here? <laughs> yeah, this guy, is, he, he's crazy. Uh, and I love how realistic it is, though, right? I mean, because you can imagine this, that you had a friend or a family member or something, or maybe yourself, I don't know. I'm not judging that, you know, and, and I was there as a young teenager being obsessed or that infatuation with somebody that you pretend it's love because you don't have a better word to explain it. And then you thinking of all of these things you would do to be with this person and things you would do to other people to negate them from being with this person that you, quote, think that you're in love with because you have this unhealthy relationship, obsession, infatuation with. That's very realistic, I think, for a lot of people sometimes. And you don't know where it comes from, and maybe you don't know why you're acting out this way against the person or persons involved in this, like, love triangle, so to speak. Well, I wonder too, what is it as a reader that draws you into the story so fast? Because we all can relate to that idea of what I'll call immoral thinking, right? Like someone makes you upset, a teacher or someone cuts you off on the road, and you might wish really bad things upon them, but you don't actually want them to happen. But it's kind of like this way of just exuding out catharsis for the negative feelings that you have. And, and when we watch and read these stories as readers, these actors, instead of just being like, well, I lost the chick or, mm, you know, I, I probably shouldn't kill this guy. I don't hate him. And, and yeah, we slept together. But the fact that they, they take that step and are willing to cross the immoral boundaries of society is part of what makes, I think, the draw of these stories so interesting. And the way that I think that, that Akutagawa has just really fine-tuned his craft is he's not like, hey, let me kill Wataru for us. He says, let us kill Wataru, right? He's making her implicit in this turning the fantasy of crossing the immoral boundary into reality for them. Agreed. I think there's also a lot of complex motivation here, and I've said this many times before, but I don't think I've said it in a while. For humans, there's... There's a lot of ways to communicate, but there's basically two ways that most people communicate, uh, verbally or physically. And I think that with the air of violence looming over this story, I think it's something that is very raw and primal for humans because we're animals too. Violence is all throughout nature. But I think this complexity of how this relationship is unfolding is something that can draw a lot of us in because 
a lot of times I think me, I know particular is I don't know how to deal with my emotions. It is something that I either wasn't taught to me or I don't know, you know, what exactly I am feeling. And so how do I, how do I react to this? Do I act with violence? Do I act with my words? Do I write something? You know, do I go the poetry route? Uh, or, you know, do I go the, you know, put the fisticuffs up route? And I, I think that that's what we're seeing here in this story. What do you mean? With Morito, he, he's having to decide, you know, is it really worth it to kill this person? And then the story kind of comes flipped because we go to Kisa and she's kind of plotting something here as well, also using violence as a method to a means to an end. It's, it's very strange because coming to that decision, right? Like you said, it's sometimes hard to understand where those, where, where do those wants come from inside of us? Like the subconscious is what some people call it. In the story we have, if my motive is not sufficiently clear, then all that remains by way of explanation is a power of unknown to mortals. Or, if one prefers, a demon bent on subverting my will and leading me down the path of evil. So, we may not know the wants or that subconscious or that devil, but we do know that it's evil. We do know that it's against and crossing those social boundaries, right? You know, it's worth pointing out for those of you that are either newer to Akutagawa or haven't read much about him, which I'm not an expert either. I think around 1917, uh, there was a really important event where he read Lindstrom, uh, Lindsberg's, uh, Lindbergh's uh, Inferno, which kind of in the back of it, he was taking notes and biographers have noted that he has this quote in here that this was an important book for him to start believing in supernatural elements to causing fate to causing how we react. So whatever Morito is aware or not aware of in his subconscious, or whether it's a demon puppeteering him into this course of action, there's an unknown push that he is not willing or able to fight controlling his actions in some ways. I didn't see much of the supernatural element in this story. Uh, I would be interesting to maybe take another pass and try to look for some of those elements and analyze it from that perspective, as we've done so, so many times with the Gutagawa, because a lot of times I think he makes it very blatant for that. But in this one, I feel like that it's that mentality of if no one can have her or if I can't have her, then no one can have her. Right. And, and that seems to be, uh, you know, a very self-serving humanistic feeling that I, I think that oh, to go back to your point of why is this so relatable? I, I think that, you know, a lot of times as humans, we are selfish. And I think that mm -hmm. that's what we see a lot in this story with um, that, that drive for, I'm going to get the girl. Nobody else will. Sure. And just to make sure uh, it was clear, I wasn't saying there was a supernatural. You'll see that quote. He says, or if one prefers a demon, he's trying to blame this unknown force to leading him down these actions, right? It's it's a way of distancing yourself from the evil that you're causing. And another way of looking at it is, is not even necessarily just if I can't have her, no one can. It's also if I get rid of him, does that mean that she's fair game and erases the sin that we've created too? Oh, Sure. And I think that that is the rationalization, you know, of someone that is desperate and that desperate people will do whatever they think is right to get what they want. And another thing that is probably very relatable to a lot of people. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I think you're 100% right there, too, because we see in the text how, you know, he's like, he's like pleading with her. And the second she agrees, he's taken back or like he couldn't believe that she did it. And then he starts to think, well, if I don't go forward with it now, she'll probably kill me. When all she did was like nod in acceptance, right? There's there's a dissonance with what this man thinks is pushing him forward. And he's inventing it, I think, a lot to justify the actions. And you could picture that too, right? I remember reading this and I, I just thought like I would look over and you would look over and I just give you a little... It's just so subtle. It'd be like, oh, that's powerful, you know, because it hits you because it's something that isn't, you know, overt. And you kind of think to yourself, did I imagine the nod or was the nod real? Because that changed the whole ball game. that now we're in succinct. We're agreeing on this. That's something that, you know, is going to give me maybe more motivation or reservation, as you said, of does does Kisa really want this or is she playing me? And then we get to part two, which is a great switch in the story, I think. 
Mm -hmm. Well, and it's part of the Akutagawa mastery of perspective, right? Because by entering Keisa's mind here, first of all, there's there's the, the theater change. Well, we're now in her private headquarters, right? We're entering her intimate space. And what's she doing? She's facing away from the light, right? She's not looking at the light, which is obviously, I think, very symbolic. She's looking into the darkness because I think this is post the decision, right? She's already come to realize that, um, I can't remember the exact English translation words, but I think they said something akin to she felt like she had been fallen or, or damaged. And now she's looking at how does she, how does she live with herself? How does she, you know, view herself after being kind of scorn by the man, like the, the man that he, she viewed loathing from Morito's eyes, I would say. Uh, two things there, right? I think that it's beautiful how the story is almost not bookended, but part one and part two with the lighting is very powerful because you had the moonlight and then you could almost think as a, as a light or a lamp of, you know, it's a silhouette of a moon almost and that she's in a dim light and moonlight is dim light. So, you know, they're both kind of experiencing these similar emotional throws, but for hers, she's, she's shamed. I, I, I think in this because she feels guilty of what has happened and that's what's pushing her as a motivator, which is very different than I feel like the lust um, that that we see in the rest of the story. Her Hers is more internal than external. Right. Well, I think there's part of the narrative, too, at least in the Charles DeWolf translation. It talks about how she wants to extricate, extricate herself through his egotism. Right. So they both are looking for an escape whether he views his as demons or this push or her to kill him if he doesn't move forward, she views his drive as her way getting out of the shame, I think. And I don't even know if it's necessarily getting a, getting out of the shame because I think some readers might be confused on, you know, I thought they were killing Wataru. What does it mean she's waiting to die? Just, just, just to be 100% sure, the, the dramatic irony here is that she agrees to let him kill Wataru, but she's going to be in Wataru's place in bed. So that when Morito comes in to kill Wataru, he's going to accidentally kill basically Kesa, which means that you have kind of like the audience catharsis. You have uh, immediate probably ramifications of looking of how did I really extricate myself from the situation? Did I really get rid of the blame? Th there's a lot of complex emotions that just explode with this type of like just total twist. And I think about that, if she's ending her own life in a roundabout way, this is almost revenge, right? She, Kesa is taking revenge on this of saying, well, you're going to get the satisfaction of killing somebody. But when you pull the sheet over, you're going to see what you've done. And I'm going to make you feel guilty and bad about what you've done because you think that you're going to get what you want. And it's going to be like double fold bad because you've killed somebody and you've killed the wrong person and you've killed the wrong person that you quote love or lust after. It's like, a, it's like a, a, a triple whammy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and, and even to your earlier point of like, you know, in terms of the remake or the conversations with stories of past, you got the Faustian deal and you have the Marlowe and the goat, the, um, Goethe, Goethe's uh, version of it, we know, like, the idea of having these conversations of stories throughout years has existed for some time. And here's another example of making a deal that is actually quite twisted when you're trying to make it with sin, with the devil, essentially. But I think that's what gives the catharsis to the audience. It, it, it allows them to kind of come clean in some regards. And then we get to the end of the story. And I don't know, how did, how did you feel about it? Because I felt, I felt wanting and that's very unusual, I feel like, for a, unusual for me when looking at an Agutagawa story, because I feel like I always get a sense of satisfaction. And I think that's done on purpose. And he got me, which, again, is just like blows my mind of how masterful he is as a writer, because I think that was his intention is, is to feel you leaving almost empty as these two people have been through this whole story. You've now experienced it and you're left in the same state that they are. Right. Right. So she extinguishes the flame opens the shutter so the moonlight comes in and if we recall that's what uh, morito was looking at you can almost picture if this were like a theater like you know you know how mm -hmm. sometimes like those houses are on wheels and they rotate you could almost yeah. see like the the house start to rotate as she's looking out the window towards the middle so the house takes up half the stage and the other half of the stage is morito looking at the moonlight and the moonlight's shining in both on on him and on her in the room as the two oh, are basically now now the two are going to oh. face each other, and thus that's the end. 
the resolution of their story. Uh, does it leave you empty? I don't know if it leaves me empty, but it makes me feel a lot better than, than some of the decisions that they were making earlier. Uh, but, but that, but that's life, right? Humanity is complex and how we deal with that guilt when she feels shamed and like, she's like a body defiled, you know, how does she then get redemption? And there's a lot of different ways people look at it, some right, some wrong. And I think some of them are very powerful. But remember, this is fiction, of course, right? So when we think about these fantasies too, right? Like when we want revenge on someone, like you might think of really drastic things such as like ending yourself or something like that. Literature is a way where we can kind of live out some of those fantasies, not because we want to actually do them, but for some reason there's something rewarding just thinking about it and imagining it, but not actually following through with some things. So as that moonlight seeps in and fills you with dread, you don't have to have done this yourself, but you still get to experience something that you might be feeling yourself. And I, I guess I just I, I think at the end of the story of uh, where where does it go from here? You know, what what happens afterwards? Yeah, Ugh. well, I guess in the original <laughs> story, there is a continuation and there is more of I guess the guy reads um I can't remember if it's like an ascetic or Buddhist life. Like he, he basically kind of goes that religious redemption route, but that's, you know, Akutagawa, our boy, he ain't going there, right? He's going to cut it off right at that, that modernist precipice edge and leave it to the reader, which I personally prefer another wonderful story from our boy. And that's great because at the end of the story, now you get to make up the ending and it leaves you on that wonderful cliffhanger, which is the, the best feeling for some people. I know some readers, they, they like to have that definitive conclusion, but uh, go read another story then, <laughs> but keep reading. Playlist of other Akutagawa story talks down below. What's been your favorite one so far? Let us know what to read next in the comments down below. My name's Benuna. Peace. Peace.